You are listening to the Courtship Code Podcast, where we use a combination of psychology, spirituality, and matchmaking industry techniques to help you elevate in your relationships from inside out. And I'm your host, Zara J, founder of BlackMuslimSingleSociety.com, The Match Society, and CaptivatingCourtship.com. Hey, everyone. So I am so excited to have here with me today, Habiba Kande. I said that right, correct? Last name? You said it perfectly well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Habiba Kande. And he is an author and a speaker. He is an author of the book, A Taste of Honey, and Kunyaza. He's the Kunyaza king over here. And he's going to talk about both of those things and just sexuality. And you really focus in, at least it seems like you really focus in on sexuality when it comes to women, like that's kind of like your specialty. You have a lot of women that are hanging on to your every word. So wow. okay. how did you get into this? Like, just it's so interesting as a male that you kind of just like spearheaded, and a Muslim male, that you spearheaded yourself into. So how did, like, what's your background? How did this come about, sexuality? Yeah, so um, where did it start? Um, so I went to, after I graduated from the university, I think in America, you refer to university as college. I went yeah. to Egypt um, to study in Al Azhar, and I came across um, a number of treaties written in Arabic from like the 16th century about pleasuring women from the perspective of, of, of the Muslim scholars at the time. So there were a number of books written by Muslim scholars, you know, about the importance of um, female sexuality or female pleasure. And, then, and encouraging men to understand and explore the woman's body and also to try and in, ensure that the woman is satisfied um, whilst they're in any form of like lovemaking. And they they were deriving sources from the Quran, from Hadith, from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from general erotologists of their time and those that preceded them. So they even drew on sources from um, the Kama Sutra, which for me was quite fascinating that, you know, especially the perception many people have about Muslims and sex and things like that, where, you know, I came across this book that was written hundreds of year, years ago, a number of books, where a number of Muslims are speaking in detail about the importance of men getting to know their female partners and pleasuring them and the importance of foreplay. So a lot of the stuff that you, you read in, a, I don't know, modern day cosmopolitan article, they were speaking about it at great length. So I thought this would be quite interesting, maybe, um, book to kind of revive that tradition because I'm sure obviously you're very well versed in the work that you do that a lot of Muslims are reluctant to kind of speak and engage about mm. conversations to, to do with sex and sexuality especially for men to speak about it um, so that's kind of what led me to write my first book A Taste of Honey mainly looking at it from um, an Islamic or Muslim perspective and then um, I was thinking of writing another book targeting towards men, but not from a religious perspective, just a general um, guide for men or young men in particular about, uh, it's a controversial topic by the topic of womanizing and why men want to womanize some of the dangers and pitfalls. And obviously being a man myself, I understand how generally a lot of men think. Um, but with that book, um, which was called Illuminating the Performance, a number of the readers were women. And most of my books, the readers were women, even that book that was targeted at men, um, and someone, one of my readers um, contacted me and asked me that why didn't I mention Kunyaza? Because the second book was about looking at African uh, erotology, which is a study of lovemaking and sexual desire from an African perspective. They asked me why didn't I mention Kunyaza? I went to Google, research, had a search of Kunyaza. I was blown away by what, you know, this tradition that was originally from Rwanda and East Africa, where it's a culture where encourages men to um satisfy their you know their wives their female partners and it's a culture which puts female pleasure on a pedestal so it's the total opposite of generally the perceptions of um sexuality in the western world where generally the focus is always on the man being satisfied so i wanted to do a bit more research into that practice and also to highlight the contributions which um black and african women have made towards um female sexuality and female pleasure because Many times when you read about these issues from, um, about sex and sexuality in Africa, you generally hear negative stories like female genital mutilation or women are being oppressed. So rather than just speaking about 
some of these things which unfortunately do happen, but speak about the positive contributions, and that's what I'm trying to do with um, like with the Kenyatta book, just to try to like salute the women that have come before me and uh, and the work that they're doing in terms of trying to raise awareness about the importance of men satisfying women in the bedroom and understanding female desire and the psychology of desire and, and female sexuality. So that's I think what led me to my those two books in a nutshell. That's really interesting because I've always looked at it and even when I talk to my friends and we talk about sex and you know all that type of stuff um, I always looked at it as you simply have pleasers and takers right so even with men I always thought that you have some men that are just naturally pleasers like they naturally just enjoy pleasuring women and they're going to be more active or more attentive in the bedroom and then you have some men that are just takers so when I'm just listening to you speaking talk about how men um don't really engage in pleasure or they don't focus on pleasing the woman I find that really intriguing so do you think that some of the takers I guess if I don't know if you even look at it that way but if the takers typically align with women who maybe struggle when it comes to um, asserting their needs, because that's something else that my friends and I have always tried to figure out. Like, are, do some women just naturally have a harder time asserting their needs so they struggle with pleasure more versus women who typically are more aggressive in the bedroom or assertive out, say, in the bedroom where they seek out to get that pleasure? Like maybe you have two takers together versus two pleasers. And so that's why sex can be a struggle. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And I like the demarcation between pleasers and takers. Um, for me growing up, um, I wouldn't like to say the word practicing, but before I try to kind of be a bit more religious, shall, shall we say, mm-hmm. the environment I was brought up in is in, and again, I, some of that is from ego, if I'm honest with you, but it was as a man, you are supposed to, when you engage in any relation, you're supposed to be someone that satisfies your partner. Now, whether you're doing that because you're really concerned about her needs or it's an ego boost or it might be a combination of the two but that was something growing up as part of manhood you're supposed to be a man who enjoys pleasuring your your partner so for me it was normalized and like right. for my older brother and a couple of few of my friends although we didn't it was sometimes you speak about your relationships but not in too much detail but for me that was that was expected that as a man you're supposed to be someone who is like you mentioned like a, a pleaser but the more I started speaking to different men, especially even men from rel- religious um, backgrounds or people that were quote unquote very practicing or what have you, they were they were the impression that sex is just about the man's pleasure. As long as I'm satisfied, that's all that matters. So even in the when it comes to engaging certain acts like um, oral stimulation, it's purely for the man. So the woman can engage in it, but as a man, I won't engage in that. Or there's some men that will be like. I would only engage in performing cunnilingus if I'm really committed to this particular woman. But if it's I'm having, again, I'm speaking about people that's engaged in casual relationships or just having relationships in general, a number of men's attitudes is there's nowhere I'll perform cunnilingus on a woman unless I'm really committed to her. So there's this idea that as a man, or with, with a lot of men who you could describe them as takers, as you mentioned, sex is all about their pleasure and it's all about penetration when. Obviously, we know there are a number of studies which um, show that, on average, most women re- require um, clitoral stimulation in order to um, experience an orgasm, and penetration is not the main way that most women on a regular basis experience um, orgasm. But in a pornified co- um, society that we're living in now, where everything is about penetration and the male gaze, for a lot of men, it's all about how strong and how fast and how much you can frost your partner when in reality that's not necessarily um something that the woman enjoys and there's a lot of women that are faking orgasms because of that and there's a disconnect between what men think is pleasuring their female partner and what women and what is actually pleasuring them and, and because unfortunately many women haven't been empowered enough to speak about their rights in the bedroom and to be assertive and even if it means they need to be aggressive so be it but there's not many women that's generally like that there's a lot of misunderstandings, even from men, and a lot of men are misinformed. So even though we're living in a, you could say, a hypersexualized society where there's a lot of information and stories and articles about sex, 
a lot of that information is incorrect. So a lot of people are misinformed. So that's why, especially as men, um, and because maybe many of us are not comfortable to engage in those conversations, and, or, and even with our partners as well, because you find that with my experience in speaking to a number of men, both in an informal capacity and, and also when I conduct a couple of workshops, a lot of men feel uncomfortable to even speak about sex and sexual pleasure with their partner, whether it's mm-hmm. their girlfriend, their wife, what have you. They're more comfortable to have that conversation with um, a, a male peer or friend that they trust. That's not going to be judgmental. But even when they're, um, you know, divulging their intimate secrets or whatever, and they, they're making themselves vulnerable, very few men would, would actually speak about some of the insecurities of what's going on in the bedroom. So because, like I said, there's a lot of men that lack correct information and they even would you say maybe scared or I don't know the, the, the right I don't know what, I don't want to say scared but uncomfortable having that conversation with their partner why they do want you to think, find out where do you think they, that discomfort comes from Brenda, sorry where do you think that discomfort comes from like do you think that's is cultural it, is it environmental or society because I don't feel like society really teaches men to be uncomfortable when it comes to expectations in the bedroom so where do you think that that in that that insecurity or that lack of vulnerability or that shyness that men secretly feel because they don't openly feel this way it's a secret feeling um why, think, where do you think that comes from i think it's cultural and uh, it comes from the fact that in whether you're in the, the, the states whether you're in western europe even parts of africa and in Asia as well, that a lot of men were taught to be we 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 we're, we're ego driven, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to the bedroom. So although a lot of men, and especially when it comes to sex, a lot of men will speak about, um, or they'll they'll, they'll speak about how good they are in the bedroom, but they won't. There's there's very few men that will that will take some time out in their life to kind of try and improve their love making skills. And I don't when I mean love making skills, I'm not just speaking about positions. Because for a lot of people, when they think about how to become a better lover, it's not to get to know your female partner, it's not to understand her body, it's not even to understand her personality, it's not to understand what turns her on. It's all about understand understanding different sex positions from the Kama Sutra. So for a lot of men, sex is performative. It's about mm. how long they can last, um, how 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 strong they can thrust, because these are things that you can measure, and how many women you can sleep with. So for a lot of men, if you've had relations with a number of women or you've had a number of, you've sired a number of children, that must mean that you've, that you're very good in bed, which obviously that's not the case. It's like the logical, for a lot of men, that's how we, the relation, that's of, how of we view it. Sorry? So it's like the logical aspect of sexuality. Like the, yeah. the men. And it's something aspect. again that you, yeah. And it's something again that I think with, with men, so it's something that you can measure, like in a sense of, oh, I lasted X amount of minutes. You know, right. a lot of men will exaggerate. It's ego driven behind it. But in terms of making yourself vulnerable, opening up, and then speaking about some of your insecurities with your female partner, for a lot of men, we look, they, we view it as just like a sign of weakness. That I don't want my lady to teach me things about her own body. As crazy as it sounds, a lot of men want to act like we, we know all the answers. So because of that, because um, like society-wise, we haven't created a space where men can um be vulnerable or be even open up or just become like I don't know teach one, let's have this conversation. It's a thing where you've got a man who is his needs are being satisfied generally in the bedroom in terms of his um reaching an orgasm. And because a number of women aren't aren't um, expressing their desire to whether achieve an orgasm or the fact that they want to be satisfied, he's none the wiser. So he's thinking, I'm fine, she's I don't know if she's okay, but there's no there's no issue. So that's where there's an issue like in terms of like the, the orgasm gap or the pleasure gap, um, which relates to the fact that men on average experience an orgasm three times more than a woman would. And there's a number of studies which kind of um, document this and prove this, that on average, like a man would orgasm 95% of the time, usually mm-hmm. or always during the sexual encounter compared to 65% of women. And it's something which, again, I would say it's a cultural issue as, as, as opposed to it being a biological issue because if you look at the rates between um, homosexual women, but lesbian women, they generally um, experience an orgasm more often than a heterosexual woman. 
And if a woman is engaging in um, self-pleasure or masturbation, a woman would experience an orgasm nine times out of ten. So if it's a if it's if if a woman can experience an orgasm when she's by herself, or she can experience an orgasm more times than not when she's with another woman, but when a man's involved, she experiences an orgasm just about over half the time. Then clearly there's an issue when the man's in the picture. So then it's now an, it's not about the woman is broken or anything like that. Or is there anything wrong with her body? That's not the case. It's the, it's the issue that when the man's in the picture, why is it that women are experiencing orgasm less or sex is less pleasurable than it would be if maybe they're with an, if she was with a female partner or she was by herself? And that plays into, again, maybe the man's being lazy in the bedroom, not being attentive to her, her needs. It might be the case that the woman doesn't feel fully comfortable with um, her male funny. partner. Even in terms, even in the bedroom, they're not communicating in terms of what their needs are. Um, so there are a number of things, factors, but I would definitely say a lot of those factors are cultural because in other parts of the world, the orgasm gap isn't as big as what it is in some parts of the United States or some parts of Western Europe. You know, I had someone seek some advice uh, from me about their relationship, about their marriage. And that's when the question came up for me, which you mentioned the, the pleasure gap. And I started questioning and noticing this trend of women saying that they're not being pleased, that they, they don't enjoy sex, that their husbands are lazy or all these other things, which was really interesting to me because I was kind of shocked that women, so many women feel just displeased in the bedroom. So when I was talking to him and he was seeking some advice and he was saying basically that his wife felt as though she never had certain sexual experiences with him or I guess he never gave her certain types of pleasure and that was like creating some problem he didn't really understand and I started to raise the question and become curious if a lot of the the link between a lot of women who feel really displeased with their partners is that because they're not assertive? Because I asked him, does she usually come on to you or do you usually come on to her? Like, does she usually initiate sex or is she usually waiting for sex to be initiated? And he said, no, she usually, I mean, no, I usually initiate sex. So she doesn't mm -hmm. initiate sex very often. So then, so I'm wondering when you speak about that pleasure gap, does most of that percentage fall on women who are just not sexually assertive. Like they usually wait for the man to come to them, like takers, like I mentioned earlier. And so because they're more of a taker and that man may be also a taker, I guess that that would cause that pleasure gap because I, I, I just don't understand why a woman would feel uncomfortable asserting her, but that's just me. I, that's something that I have a hard time understanding because that's just mind blowing to me. Like if, why wouldn't you, be assertive with your husband why wouldn't you feel comfortable asserting but it seems like a lot of women just aren't comfortable asserting and so they kind of are just silently suffering yeah and i mean i would add to that as unfortunate the fact that unfortunately there are a lot of women who who don't feel that they're entitled to pleasure even within mm. the confines of marriage mm. so there are a number of women who feel that sex is for the man it's not it's not for them so if if you've got a woman who's who's of that mindset of that belief that yes I'm going to engage in this for him it's not about me that's why they probably wouldn't be assertive in the bedroom whereas if you're coming from a standpoint which no this is a mutual act for both of us to enjoy and I want my rights as much as you do I've got as much of a right to enjoy um, pleasure as much as you do then you will be assertive but if which is unfortunately the case for many women um, in, across different cultures where they believe that sex is about the man about the about the man about the man um enjoying himself and that's why a number of women would even fake it in the bedroom not because and again it's all to please his ego it's not for herself because again if she were to express her displeasure then obviously it might make him feel a type of way he might be disgruntled or some women obviously fake an orgasm just to end the sex session in 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 its entirety but generally it's for the male's ego and i think a lot of that comes the fact that unfortunately a lot of women aren't empowered where they believe that they are entitled to pleasure i remember there was a um i don't know if it was a tweet or interview that Nicki minaj gave i think it was 2017 or 18 when she said something along the lines of that um she demands climax when she's with um her uh, her partner 
Now, that went viral, and the Huffington Post was speaking about it. A number of mainstream outlets were speaking about it. And a lot of women resonated with what Ona were surprised by that, that she demanded to be satisfied in the bedroom. Now, I'm not surprised that there are a number of women who are, who aren't, um, who are just, who you could say are takers, because culturally, again, across different cultures, that's the expectation is that sex generally is for the man. Um, an orgasm, if she gets it, that's fine. But the fact that a lot of women don't experience an orgasm on a regular basis, why would she feel that she's in touch and, and, and seek it? So I have a that question. Sense, I think, yeah, go okay. on. No, so, okay, so when you say that a lot of women don't feel entitled to it, because it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around. <laughs> so when you say that a lot of women don't feel entitled to it or they see sex as only for the man, which is super interesting, because I know that that's not just limited to certain cultures or certain faiths, because you just see women, even when you hear stories about married couples, you hear about the woman like begrudgingly having sex with her husband or not really wanting to, right? So, and, and I know that you've, you've spoken all around the world, you have talked to so many people when it comes to pleasure. Um, is this more for, so for women, are they just not enjoying the act or is it just already a mental block there that's not even allowing them to enjoy it? Because for me, okay, even if they feel like it's for the man, in the act, it should become, ple- it, it should be, even if they don't climax, right? It should be pleasurable. So wouldn't they still see it as for them as well? Or is there just an automatic mental block that's just like, let's just get it over with and move on? It's not like, is that what's going on? Oh, I would say a lot of women, not obviously not all, but a lot of women don't actually enjoy that. And one of the reasons, I remember yeah. I gave a talk in, um, in Brazil and again Brazil the perception that a lot of women are sexual you know highly sexualized and sexual and sensual which is not the case for obviously all all Brazilian women but there was one of the ladies she mentioned that she doesn't enjoy sex and one of the reasons being is because of her um her boyfriend at the time doesn't pay any attention to her needs when it comes to foreplay so because he's going straight into penetration before she's even reached any state of arousal she doesn't enjoy it and that's also one of the issues that a lot of men the idea of engaging foreplay, especially when you're in you're in a long term relationship or or marriage, mm-hmm. a lot of men just feel like, what's the point? I want to go straight into what I've, what I'm here for. Now I can understand if if that's the experience that a number of women are engaging in, because they're not aroused and their genitalia is not ready to receive, uh, you know, his his manhood. She is it's, again not all women are, are built this way, but it's, it's difficult for a woman to even enjoy the penetration that she's going to receive. So I can understand it again. And what I would say is remember that there are a lot of women who maybe aren't as empowered as yourself where you may know what you your your rights are and what you want. I didn't say me. So got, I'm just saying. Not you, but I'm just saying. No, no sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to personalize. I'm not saying you personally. I'm talking about the culture. So the reason why, because like the culture that I grew up in, the, the subculture, and I'm not, I'm not speaking right. about the UK. I'm talking about the subculture within right. the UK that I grew up in it was normal for a man to be a pleaser, right? Mm. But then when I, the more I spoke to different men outside of my circle of friends, even within my circle of friends, I realized that most men are actually takers. They're not actually, they don't really care about the needs of their partner. Do you understand? So because it was, so if I looked at it like, because how I grew up in my, and it was norm, it was expected for a man to be a pleaser and he should be, like for me, I, I, I can't understand why a man is not interested in learning how to satisfy women. Right. For me, it's like, so the fact, so even when you mentioned in the beginning that it's quite strange that, you know, as a man, you're speaking about female pleasure. I'm not going to speak about male pleasure because that's not my thing. I'm not interested in men. Hmm. So the fact that a lot of men are, you know, obviously heterosexual men, why wouldn't you be wanting to know more about, about how, how to how satisfy to women? For me, for me, but it's I just. It's, a lot of I, women are the same way. Like, a lot of women aren't really interested in being a better lover either they I, I feel like more may be interested in them getting pleasure but not necessarily interested in how to give pleasure better do you think, like, I would you say think because, it's the same way yeah i agree i would say that a lot of i would say a lot of men are more interested in so, being a yeah, better lover than women because again it comes down to this idea that sex is it's for the man mm. 
because you don't hear you, you hear about women wanting to know more about love and how to be um and and that's why even with my books and some of the work i do i, I try to be quite explicit from the outset that okay we're going to be speaking about sex rather than saying we're going to be speaking about marriage or love because that's a all-encompassing term that can you, you can have obviously a, 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 a happy marriage without really well for some people really engaging in much sex or you can have a, a, a nice love and relationship and sex is maybe a small component of that but if i'm speaking about if i say from the outset it's about sex you know what i'm speaking about um and whilst i i find that a number of women that i've spoke to um are interested in my work from the perspective of how can we make men better lovers it's not really for themselves so i would agree with what you said that a lot of women again i'm not saying all but a number of women I've come across, they're more interested in how can we make men better lovers, better, more attentive, more romantic. It's not how could I be better in the bedroom. Why do you think that just, is? I, I think some women feel that they're just naturally great in the bedroom mm. for whatever reason. And they think that men are very simple. So even I had a workshop last week and we were speaking about um, fake orgasms and the fact that men, there are some men who fake, whether it's fake orgasms or fake pleasure in the bedroom and a lot of women were really shocked by that that a man would fake it in the bedroom like as if it's so easy to turn us off like we yes a lot of men were easily aroused but the, they, they couldn't believe that I'm giving him everything that he wants and it's like not all the time right I hear so a this lot is, of I did, women complain yeah. about a woman not really being good in a bedroom I hear that a lot like yep. I, even if I'm reading about it or just you know hearing conversations yep. looking at things online but I, I hear a lot of men complain and a lot of women seem to like you said be pretty clueless like what do you mean like I'm not this isn't enough <laughs> <laughs> you know right. so yeah that's interesting and also we were, we're trying to protect with well, the way the men sit this is why I think men find it a difficult conversation to have or uncomfortable conversation to have is because some men maybe because they lack the vocabulary to articulate themselves without hurting their partner's feelings mm. they'll just prefer to be silent but a lot of men find that their 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 the part their partner is not that good whether it's performing fellatio whether it's just in a bedroom some women just lie there and think of england some women <laughs> just excuse me just like no seriously and these are a lot of frustrations that men have now when i have these discussions in open forum and then the women will say well the men should be a better teacher the, a teacher is only as good as a student a student and i've heard men say that a major problem that they experience with women when it comes to pleasure in the bedroom is women one not being assertive like they want to feel like the woman wants it just as bad as he does they don't like yeah. it when they feel like they're always aggressing or like um, they're the one that's doing all the work. They want to feel like a woman is also involved. She also wants it. She's also pleasing. And that that's not that easy to come across. It's not. And again, not that I'm caping for women, but I can understand for some women, it's this idea that if I come across as um, I'm really enjoying myself in the bedroom, then some men will feel intimidated by that and be and will think for some reason that, are you sleeping around because like you're really enjoying like with men it's like this the whole um you know the whole is it the virgin madonna complex where we want our women to be quote unquote you know no one's going near them sexually but at the same time in the bedroom they need to be wild and like right. you know so it's, it's this complex that many men have so i think for, for a number of women they shut down because if they come across as and you, I, I do find this in in certain um, cult, mm -hmm. subcultures, like uh, in the Asian community, because there's a number it's of women who assert what I do with Asian communities that that a lot of women struggle with that. Now, with um, particularly in the UK, like with African Caribbean communities, it might be similar to the African American community in the US. Mm -hmm. The women, again, I'm generalising, but they're a bit more assertive, so you, th that issue isn't there as much. Right. That's why, again, I would say it obviously depends on the person's culture, their background, and even their own value systems in terms of how, what their feelings and thoughts are about sex. But men, even men who are from um, cultures where they engage in mutual satisfaction with both partners, they do find it difficult to communicate that with a woman. It's like with their, because, again, they don't want to hurt their feelings. How do you tell someone... Um, you know, I want you to be a bit more engaged. I want you to 
because you don't want to say I want you to act like you're enjoying it, but some men they they would have because I'm part of a lot of um, like WhatsApp groups or, or I used to be part of WhatsApp groups, but that would always come up in conversations with men. That, that's one of the frustrations that many men have. But then when the question is asked, do you have that conversation with whether it's your girlfriend, your wife? Very few do because again they're thinking of protecting or they think they're protecting their wife's feelings. Well, I I actually just had a conversation about this earlier about transparency and openness and trust in relationships and that i i personally just feel like when a couple has a hard time having some of the more difficult more intimate more transparent conversations to me that's the indicator that there's a trust issue in the relationship and so when um you speak about sex and being open and honest i feel like is that an indication that there's maybe do you think you may not know for a fact but do you think that there's a lack of trust and transparency in those relationships like there's already something that's a little bit unstable in that relationship so they're afraid to fully be authentic to fully be themselves or is that kind of just like the standard and what's known as normal and expected I'm I'll, can you expound on that? Because on that on the, on the first point a bit more in, in terms of the trust element, because I just want to understand your line of thinking. Because someone is not as transparent as maybe as you'd like them to be. Why do you think there's a, um, a trust issue? A because trust I issue, yeah. Sure, because I feel like when you feel like you can be fully yourself with someone. You feel right. like you can be fully seen. You feel like you can be fully heard. You feel like your uh, needs and wants will be validated. Um, and you also, you, you're coming to relationships. Like for example, when I'm coaching women and I'm working with women on courtship or finding a partner or getting to that space of feeling confident when it comes to relationships, a large part of that is authenticity. Um, so that they feel comfortable being themselves and feeling really uh, transparent and authentic. Because if you can do that, then you can be vulnerable in a relationship. You can open up in a relationship because you're not afraid of being seen or heard. But when you lack that authenticity, you, you're really scared. You don't trust the, uh, the other person, for one, because um, you're afraid to be fully seen. You're afraid to be fully heard. And you, you have a hard time expressing yourself you have a hard time expecting your needs to get met um you don't really expect mm. it and, and you have a big fear of judgment and rejection so a part of getting over that fear of judgment and rejection is getting to a place where you're fully authentic and just unapologetically you and when you're in that space and you attract a partner from that space that you feel like i can be comfortable with this person i can be vulnerable with this person because I feel compatible with this person. I feel like they're going to validate my needs. They're going to hear me. They're going to see me. Um, then you can trust the person more, right? So you can feel like you can okay. open up because, and you also have a desire to understand them and to be understood. One of the most basic human desires is to be understood. But when mm -hmm. we don't fully understand ourselves and we're not fully authentic, then we have a hard time trusting others. And we also have a hard time with understanding other people or feeling like anyone would understand us. So I feel like trust and authenticity and transparency um, is all goes in when it comes to vulnerability and being able to be completely open and naked with your partner. Like we're more comfortable being physically naked than emotionally naked. And you have to get to that space where like you feel very comfortable. And I, and I do think that's rare in relationships. I think most people don't feel like they can be really open and just naked with their partner. Um, so that shows in their inability to be physically naked. I would agree with that, but I think that is, I think it's, few people would will, will, will reach that level. Mm. So for a lot of people, they would feel that they are in a satisfying relationship without fully, again, especially with a lot of men, because I don't think a lot of men allow exactly. themselves to be fully vulnerable with their mm -hmm. partners but even if it's their wife again because of their views of um i need to be the dominant one i need to be the teacher 
I need to know, be the person that I always know what I'm doing. So they might be vulnerable and open up to whether it's their non-judgmental friend or someone that they respect another man. But it's a different... It's not, you know, I think how a lot of men will look at it, it's not that they, 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 they do not trust their partner, but they don't want to open up and be vulnerable to their partner because in their mind, that might emasculate them in the eyes of the woman. But let me pause that for a second because I'm glad that you brought yeah. that up. Now, one of the things that I also know, notice that's common and I read about this all the time and have conversations about this, that whole, you know, Madonna complex, what did you call it? Like the virgin Madonna thing that men have going on. Like they want to view their woman or their wife as this very innocent stripper, right? So <laughs> with that, um, that vulnerability that they struggle with to have with their wife, they tend to feel comfortable with a mistress or yeah, with an outside or with someone else. Like they yeah. can be vulnerable and open and do these other things and share those fancies and those secrets with someone else. But with, with their wife, they don't feel like they can do that. Like, what is that? Like, where does that, is that, again, is that just conditioning, like societal condition and cultural conditioning? Or like, why is it that you can be more comfortable with, it's not even just a stranger. Because like I said, it could be a mistress. It could be someone that they designate yeah. that they can be this with and open up and share all this with. And sometimes you'll mm-hmm. read articles or see in movies and TV shows that the man can be completely vulnerable, share all his inner secrets and things with this mistress, but he can't do that with the wife. It's just like a block that he just can't open up in that same way. Okay, I'm going to try and explain something which... It makes sense in the in the mindset of a lot of men, even though when I actually was say it doesn't actually make sense, but I'm gonna try and mm. <laughs> explain the way a number of men we view the reason why we can be um open up and be vulnerable with um you wanna call it a mistress or someone on someone that you've seen on the side as opposed to your wife, is because you look at your wife as this venerated individual that you respect and because you respect her so highly you, she can't see you as, and you're just supposed to be the protector. You, she can't see you as someone who is some. For, she can't see any weakness in you. Whereas with the mistress, although you're opening up and you're vulnerable to her, you might not have the same level of respect for her as you do for your wife. And the man's mind, again, not all men, but generally where they've got this Madonna virgin or Madonna whore complex, is um, with the mistress sexually i can open up but it doesn't mean she holds that level of respect in my heart in terms of as i look as i look at as an individual as a, as a whole person or the mother of my children although they might sound contradictory in a sense of okay if you've got your wife who's the mother of your kids and someone that you, that you claim to adore and love why how can you not open up to this woman but you can open up to a complete stranger or someone that you don't that you're saying that you don't really respect as much as you do your wife is because with men, we compartment, we compartmentalize the two that my wife, the figure of my, my, I look at my wife as my wife, the mother of my child, but not as a lover. Whereas the mistress, I look at just solely as a lover. That's, and sometimes again, not all, but a lot of men, we separate the two as if, as if when you've become the, and some women unfortunately do this as well, that when you become the mother, you're no longer like the lover anymore. Your, your, your role is like you've, um, evolved from when you were dating or seeing each other or courting to being a lover and then when you become the, especially the mother of of of, uh, of the ch- of the children now you're a different you're 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 in a different status and that's why even for some men there are some acts that they feel that they wouldn't feel comfortable doing with their wife because they're thinking excuse me for my language but I don't want you to, I don't want to be doing certain things with you and that's the same orifice your mouth that you're going to be kissing my children with i've heard men say that mm, that's so interesting which is again it's, it's really strange but, but he's gonna i understand kiss how the they children too. <laughs> sorry so but he's going to kiss the children too <laughs> i know but again we don't look at it, we're walking contradictions but we don't look at it like that so it's like because you're now the mother of my kids i i don't i'm a, and i'm only looking at you in that light it's difficult for me to you to look at you as the woman, the lover that was doing crazy things two years ago before you had children, which is, mm-hmm. again, it's crazy. But then all of that comes down to, is to how, how we view 
the role of wife or the mother um, and the mistress. It come, it's not an issue, I would say, with the, with the woman has, itself, but again, a lot of it comes into how we view these individuals. And, I, and I'll say with a, lot of me, with a number of men, um, their best or their most pleasurable sexual experiences could be with a woman that they don't really open up with. Mm. And they're not vulnerable with because again they they come away from this experience like I did this I did that because for a number of men sex is performative so I've done some so I've given you certain pleasures and I've shown you certain things that you wasn't aware of because I was like your teacher that's a sense of that's a greater level of gratification for me rather than me being vulnerable and all and and you're teaching me things about you and I'm telling you things about me in a way we're at the same level. And for some men, that's not gratifying. They want to be the quote-unquote boss in the bedroom. So whilst I do appreciate, and I've heard that many times for women, that the importance of um, transparency and being vulnerable and things like that, for a number of men, that's not necessarily, that won't equate to the most gratifying and enjoyable sexual experience, mm. which is, again, it's just a weird dichotomy that many men have, but again, I'm not saying for all, um, but... I think it's important that for couples or, or you know, people that are in relationships communicate in terms of what their needs are and what their wants are. But I don't think a lot of men are willing to open up. And because and some men don't think that women will listen to them, if I'm honest mm. with you as well. That's another reason why men will kind of, you know, they'll say, they'll talk it with their friends or, you know, their, their peers. But they feel that if they were to speak about some of their insecurities with their um you know, their wife or their long-term partner, what have you, she's more likely to judge them as opposed to um, the mistress, or even, even not even the mistress, even like a um, a working woman, like a prostitute. There are some men that will will say, will speak about some of their concerns with um, women that they pay to have sex with more than someone that they're actually in a relationship with. But see, what you just said is exactly what I was saying about like transparency and trust. Because like you just said, they, they're worried that that wife would judge them. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're scared of judgment, because you kind of don't trust, you, you don't trust that, that per, you, well, like I'm trying to uh, get out. When you, when you feel like this person's going to judge you, you don't really trust their reaction. You don't trust how they're going to, you know, so that's why I was saying that there's like a trust issue. Because when you feel like this person understands you, you can trust them more. Even if it's just the prostitute, right? Like there's a level of trust. Yeah between the prostitute and the John that mm. this person is going to be able to understand my needs, yes. you know, and not judge me. So that's why I said, like, I feel like it's a, a trust issue. And there was something that you said about, um, oh, I totally forgot, but I, I'll get back to that in a second. But I, I have a question. It's kind of off topic. But so when you talk about a man needing or being able to open up to the wife, in a different way. I had a guy tell me one time, a polygynous man, who said that he has his wife that's a soulmate, a wife that is like a business partner, and then his next wife will be his fun wife or like his pleasure wife. Like, do you really think, do men really think in those terms? That's kind of, yeah, I understand, I understand what he's saying. I'm not saying like, when I'm saying I understand it, that's how some men, when I mentioned earlier that there's, like, we compartmentalise women, as in there's some women, like, that's the mother of my child, mother of my children, that's woman, like, like he was saying, the businesswoman that he can maybe have a conversation with about his ambitions or his aspirations and things like that, and there's a woman that, or, like, his wife, another wife would be someone that he enjoys with sexually. Because some men feel like you can't get that all in one person. And sometimes you might not be able to get all of that in one person. So I do understand that. And I've heard things like that from men before. It's unfortunate. And I, and I think obviously a lot of women wouldn't like to hear that. But that's his truth. But he probably could get that with um, one person. But he would need to open up and say, okay, for example, the woman that he's... Uh, he sees as a, did you say a business partner? Mm -hmm. Why can't she be the fun? Why couldn't why couldn't she be right. the fun wife? You know, right. we are multifaceted, you know, beings. It's not that because someone is ambitious or very good at business, it doesn't mean they're boring in the bedroom. But I think with some people, we look at okay, if you're and you have this even within in religious circles, like if someone is quote unquote, you know, has a relationship with God or tries to be religious, then 
they can't have a sense of humor or they can't engage you know so, so we look at people as if they're one way rather than being multifaceted and i think that's the, what he's describing is how some not only men but people how we view individuals that, that if someone is a quote-unquote intellectual he's just an intellectual you can't engage in engage in like frivolous talk or if someone is um a fun person like a fun wife she can't be someone that would trust to raise a family which is i think is wrong because the same way he as an individual he realizes he's that multifaceted being that can be serious with business someone that's fun in the bedroom and what was the first one the one that he like his soulmate why can't you find a woman that can potentially encompass those three things like you are? Right. Do you think that's just like... But I do understand. Just I feel do like understand. I do. Sorry? I said, do you think that that's just like most people feel as though they have to settle? Like I can only have this or I'm just going to kind of put people in a box and just focus on this box? Or like why, why do you think that we think that way when it comes to relationships or when it comes to pleasure or anything else when it comes to male and female? I think because we don't have that conversation. So like I said before about how he's demarcated the three types of women, the person that's his soulmate, why can't that soulmate be someone that is the business partner? Or why right. can't that person be? It's not like he said, I want a wife that is six foot two, the other wife that is mm -hmm. five foot five, and the other wife is five foot. That's different. I can, even though that can sound crazy, but I can understand that because there's clearly three different types of characteristics. But... What he described, you you could have all of that in one person. Right. The same, because he's that, that one person, but it's maybe because he's, either he thinks that he can't have that in one person or he's not allowing, he's putting women in the boxes and saying, no, you're going to be that woman. You're, and, and that sounds very simplistic. Um, I hear it a lot, but I think if he's communicating with women, he can probably find that the woman that's his soulmate, there's no reason for the soulmate, um, can't be the fun person in the bedroom especially if like what you mentioned earlier about him being which i do agree with um being fully transparent and um trusting his partner then you can explore her body she can explore you and you can have different experiences that you probably wouldn't have if there wasn't that trust there the reason why um when i mentioned earlier i i think what you mentioned is the ideal but because i think a lot of people aren't going to attain that ideal i think a lot of people the norm is not to fully open up with your partner, especially with a lot of men. So they don't look, that, that, that's like a lofty ideal that is very nice in principle. I don't think a lot of men think they can get there. And I don't think you kind of hear that in male narrative stories when they're speaking about sex. Because it's, it's like when you watch, you know, the Hollywood films, um, even when you watch certain sitcoms, the way it's depicted for men is that it's not like this one woman is going to be everything for you. You're gonna, that's why you need more than you one know, like, more than one because these different women can fulfill different needs mm -hmm. and generally when you it's not like these women um have immutable characteristics that like i mentioned one six foot one's five but it's not that it's just that one's more fun the other one's more um more you know intellectual the other one and that same man is the, all those things but we feel that the, that one woman couldn't have all of those characteristics that's why well, i think it's easy to put people in boxes well, and what you're saying is, is really making me think right now because I'm thinking that also plays into how men and women just operate with relationships, right? Where women really put the pressure on themselves to find this one man who's going to be everything to them, right? Yeah. He has to be tall, dark, and handsome. He has to be educated. He has to have a, good, have a good career. He needs to be funny. He needs to be a family man. He needs to be good in bed. He needs, like, he has to be everything, right? And we often look at men and we might look at the woman that they're with and like, hmm, she only has like bits and pieces. Like, you know, why can't the men are already programmed and trained that they don't need it all from her. They can get mm -hmm. it from different, you know, women or different areas of life. Might not even just be from different women. I can get this from my friends. I can get this from work. I can get this. They don't need it all from one person. But women are really conditioned to expect that man to, to meet all of her needs. Yeah, and that's why maybe men, um, I mean, you, you know more than, more about this than I do, are more likely to quote-unquote settle for less when, because they're not thinking that that one woman can, will give them everything. Whereas maybe because a lot of women are seeking Mr. Right or Mr. Perfect, that ticks all those boxes, and it's unlikely that they'll find all of that in one individual, 
it'll be harder for such a woman to find a mate unless she feels that she's sacrificed some of her mm-hmm. her needs. Whereas with a man, he doesn't go with all of those high like all of those expectations that I want this one woman to to have all of these um it's characteristics and qualities. Yeah. It's typically yeah. more simplistic. And also, um, with that, I think that like you said, men typically, I don't want to say settle for less, but they do have a very simplistic way of seeking partners. You know, does she respect me? Am I attracted to her? Not even the most attracted to her, but am I attracted to her? (laughs) Does she respect me? You know, and does she give me a sense of peace? You know, like it's for the most part, there might be some other things that he might be looking for, but those are kind of just like the general things versus women are definitely putting themselves under pressure to have a man meet more needs and more requirements. And I think just even in relationships, women tend to want that man to meet. I, I, he needs to be my best friend. He needs to be my lover. He exactly. Needs to be, right. You right. Know, <laughs> it's just like, why does he have to do all those things? And you have to learn right. to like, allow outside relationships to also fulfill you. But women don't usually do that. They usually put a lot of pressure on a man to meet all of her needs. And that's just really interesting that you brought that up. If you've been listening to the Courtship Code podcast, opening emails, and following content online, then I know that you're the type of person who values quality relationships and is ready to break up with your bad relationship habits. I want you to go ahead to CaptivatingCourtship.com and book your free 20-minute consultation where we're going to discuss your current bad relationship habits and how working together in our signature Wounds to Worth six-week program is going to help you to heal your emotional wounds, increase attraction, and position yourself with a real strategy on how to start meeting quality partners and attracting quality relationships. So go ahead to CaptivatingCourtship.com and book your free 20-minute discovery call and let's start captivating courtship.